The human body can only survive freezing water for about 30 minutes before succumbing to hypothermia. So, when the Titanic struck an iceberg on a chilly April 14, 1912, over 1,500 people were already doomed. The boat was understocked with lifeboats, and all other aid was too far away to save the passengers floating in the water. It was one of the greatest naval tragedies in modern history, and it was avoidable. Stay tuned as we examine the events that led up to the sinking of the Titanic and relive the event through the stories of survivors. Part of the reason this event was so tragic was that some people thought it was the result of a prophecy. We might dismiss such an idea today, but 14 years before the Titanic sank, Morgan Robertson published a book called The Wreck of the Titan, or Futility. In this book, Robertson follows a sailor who survived the sinking of the largest ocean liner that had ever sailed the Atlantic Ocean. The Titan was about as long as the Titanic, could hold almost as many passengers, and sunk on an April night after striking an iceberg, losing half of its passengers due to an inadequate number of lifeboats. Before the Titanic, the story was regarded as a novelty, but afterward, the similarities between fiction and fact were eerie enough to strike fear into the public's hearts. Of course, Robertson's story did not sink the Titanic. He was pointing out many of the safety concerns that he, as an experienced sailor, saw in the early 20th century. Many of the laws and regulations we have today surrounding ocean liners were sparked by this disaster. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, companies were not worried about what to do in the event of an accident. Instead, they were focused on building luxury liners without spending any more money than necessary on safety requirements. This was the first problem. The Titanic was the largest luxury liner at the time. There were 10 decks, room for nearly 3,550 people, and it was as tall as a 17-story building at the time. White Star Line was responsible for building the ship, and they spent $7.5 million, about $400 million today. Although they wanted to appeal to luxury travelers, they also needed to appeal to people who would travel in steerage, which was the third class and often used by poor immigrants looking to move to America. In fact, the rooms in steerage on the Titanic were even nicer than the places the immigrants would live in upon arrival. Because White Star Line had spent so much money on the boat, they were eager to turn a profit as soon as possible. The ship set out on her maiden voyage on April 10, 1912 and there were already points of concern. There was a coal strike in progress, so White Star Line pooled all of their coal into their most prestigious boat to prevent moving back the launch date. There were crew members who had never sailed, including the only man who had the key to the binoculars, so the crew ended up sailing the Titanic without any help seeing where they were going, other than what they could see with the naked eye. As soon as they left the dock, the ship almost collided with the USMS New York, which was pulled toward the ship by the strength of the luxury liner's personal undertow. There had never been a boat this size, and the crew was still working out how to steer it safely. However, none of this stopped them, because everyone believed the Titanic was unsinkable. We might scoff at such an idea now, but at the time, the engineers thought they had put in the proper safety measures by installing 16 empty chambers at the bottom of the ship. The boat could still float with no issues if up to four of these chambers were filled. Many people hailed this as a modern marvel that would keep the small city afloat through any circumstance. The navigation office was also filled with state-of-the-art technology, like a telegraph. Passengers were so excited to be able to update friends and family of their trip that the telegraph operators did not pay much attention to incoming messages about icebergs in the area. They alerted the captain, but no one was concerned. In fact, the captain redirected the ship south of the original course, but never received the incoming messages about icebergs in that area as well. The men on lookout duty were watching, but there was a new moon that night, and they were working without binoculars as the ship ran full steam ahead underneath them. They didn't see it coming until it was too late. At 11.40 p.m., the iceberg was sighted, and less than a minute later, the ship crashed against it at full speed. Upon assessment, Thomas Andrews discovered that five of the 16 compartments had been breached and were filling with water. If it had been only five, the boat would have sunk more slowly. But the compartments were open at the top, so as soon as one chamber filled, water rushed into the next chamber. 
He would go on to be remembered for selflessly helping people into lifeboats and life jackets, and for trying to give people in the water the best chance of survival by throwing over anything they could float on. The Titanic sank in two hours and 40 minutes, pulled in two by its own weight. There were not enough lifeboats for everyone, and several of the lifeboats left the ship half empty as panic ensued. Although that fateful night was a tragic event, it was also a time of great heroism, best demonstrated through the stories of the people on board. Those survivors give us a more personal look into what happened late on April 14th and early on April 15th in 1912. One of the most well-known stories is about the eight musicians who played while the ship sank. They were not part of the crew and had every right to fight for a spot in the lifeboats, but they went with their instincts as artists and played music to help keep the other passengers calm. They played until the boat went under in an attempt to help everyone else. And the last song of their immortal requiem was supposedly Dream of Autumn, a popular song at the time. Miss Dorothy Gibson was a famous actress on board the ship as part of her vacation. That fateful night, she didn't begin to feel any concern until she felt the bolt tilting. She and her mother hustled upstairs, and they were among the first people to leave the sinking ship in Lifeboat 7. From the relative safety of the lifeboat, she watched the ship disappear into the depths and heard the terrible cry that rang out from the people who were thrown into the sea and others who were afraid for their loved ones. Although Ms. Gibson survived, many others did not, and Ramon Artigavatilla was not one of those lucky survivors. He had already survived the sinking of the America years earlier, and he worked hard to overcome his fear and step aboard the Titanic, welcoming a new chance at life. This was a big step for him, but tragedy seems to follow some people more closely than others. As the Titanic sank, Ramon did not make it into a lifeboat. He was last seen alive on the ship's deck talking with two friends. But his body was one of the few recovered, and he was buried in his home country of Uruguay. Many men did not survive the tragedy because they were expected to give up their seats in the lifeboats to women and children, regardless of economic or celebrity status. Still, some men did make it into lifeboats and survived, but many others were not so lucky and are remembered as dying as true gentlemen. Benjamin Guggenheim refused to be hustled into a lifeboat ahead of women and children, which means that he ended up standing on the deck of the boat, dressed in his best clothes, as the ship went under. John Jacob Astor IV was even wealthier than Guggenheim. He was the most famous person on board. However, when he tried to join his pregnant wife in lifeboat 4, he was told that he had to wait for the rest of the women and children to finish boarding. He never made it onto a lifeboat and was last seen smoking a cigar on deck. His wife gave birth to their final child four months later. Although priority was given to women boarding the lifeboats, some women refused to leave their loved ones behind. Anne Elizabeth Isham was traveling with her beloved dog, but she refused to leave the Titanic without her Great Dane. She was one of four first-class women to die that morning, and when her body was recovered, she was still holding on to the best friend she refused to leave behind. Love was as heavy as tragedy in the air that night. Isidore Strauss and his wife Rosalie Ida, famous philanthropists, stayed behind because he refused to board a lifeboat before the other men, and Ida refused to leave her beloved husband of 40 years. Gerda and Edvard Lindell were a young Swedish couple in steerage. Because steerage was not allowed onto the ship's deck until so late in the evacuation process, they couldn't secure a seat in the lifeboats. As they slid down the deck into the icy water, they managed to catch on to a collapsible lifeboat. Although Edvard was able to pull himself up, Gerda did not have the strength. Edvard held onto her hand, hoping it would be enough to save them. But Gerda died from either hypothermia or a heart attack. Edvard died shortly afterward seemingly too heartbroken to continue living. Many second-class passengers fared little better than the steerage passengers. Like those in steerage, they were not allowed on board the deck until it was almost too late. So, good people like Annie Clemmer Funk, a teacher for girls in India, Father Thomas Biles, Father Joseph Parishitz, and Reverend John Harper, who heard final confessions and preached the gospel as the waves came rolling in, never stood much of a chance. And yet, Despite all the loss and heartbreak, there were still people who survived. Violent Constant Jessup was a stewardess on board, 
and she was ordered into a lifeboat to show the first-class women that it was safe. As the boat was being lowered, a baby was dropped into her lap. Only then did she realize that this demonstration was about to be a whole lot longer than she had originally planned. Eight hours later, the baby and his mother were reunited on board the Carpathia, making for one of the few bright points of the night even if Violet was never properly thanked for her assistance in the demonstration. Few of those who fell into the water survived, and it is estimated that 68% of the passengers on board the Titanic died. Lifeboat Collapsible B became the most important lifeline for the people in the water, and 25 people survived by pulling themselves onto this overturned lifeboat. Three more were rescued from the water, but there were no more survivors by the time the Carpathia arrived in the water. The public outrage after this disaster sparked changes throughout the boating industry. The United States Congress held a special hearing to ensure that such a disaster would not happen again. Never again could communication signals be unmanned or ignored, and never again could ships sail without enough lifeboats for everyone. While this hasn't eliminated maritime disasters, it has gone a long way to make ships safer and ensuring that the noble actions of the people on the Titanic were not undertaken in vain. To learn more about the Titanic, check out our book, Titanic, a captivating guide to the history of the unsinkable ship RMS Titanic, including survivor stories and a real romance story. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free mythology bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.